This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Um, and we're going to do one thing today, but it's pretty cool, and it's this. We're going to look at autonomous linear dynamical system x dot equals ax. And we are going to overload. Uh, so far, we've actually overloaded. That's a, if, that's a scalar equation. We, everyone here knows the solution of that. That's x of t equals uh, e to the ta times x of 0, like that. So we, we know, everyone knows this. We are going to overload, actually, all of these things to the vector matrix case. So we've already overloaded this scalar, simple scalar differential equation by capitalizing A and making A and N by N matrix and X of vector. So we've already overloaded the differential equation itself. Later today, we're going to overload the exponential to apply to matrices. So that's, that's, our, that's our goal today. And the cool thing, I mean, the nice thing about, I mean, what you, what you want in, over, in overloading and, and, and extending notation is you want it to suggest you want it to connect to things you already know, so it should remind you of things you know. It should make you guess a bunch of things, only some of which are true. So that's, 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 how you, that's what real overloading should do, right? That, that's, that's how it should work. If everything were true, then it's kind of stupid. You should have defined it more generally in the first place, and I don't even really call it a real generalization. So that's, if you really want to do it, you want to, you want to extend it in such a way that it suggests many things some of which are true. So, okay, so the first thing we'll do is we'll just solve this by Laplace transform. And I'll just review this very quickly, even though this is a, a prerequisite. So here it is. Suppose you have a function that maps R plus into an P by Q matrices. So we're, we're going to go straight to matrices uh, from scalars. And so Z itself is a function that maps non-negative scalars into p by q matrices. So it's a p by q matrix valued function on R plus. That's what Z is. Now the Laplace transform, uh, that's written several ways. Um, one is to actually have a, a, a calligraphic or script L, uh, which is an operator. And it, it takes as argument a function of this form and returns the Laplace transform, which is another function. It's a function from some subset of the complex plane into complex p by q matrices. So that's what it is. Now it turns out for us we're not going to worry too much about what this domain is. I'll say a little bit about that, um, but not much. So, so the Laplace transform is actually quite a complicated object. It's, it's actually very useful, uh, maybe just once, to sit down and think about what it is. Um, if, for example, how would you declare, declare it, how would you declare it in a computer language? Right, so for example, C or something like that. Just so you understand, it's very easy to casually write down you know, little things with eight ASCII characters, which pack a lot of meaning. So L is itself a, fu it is a function. It is a function that accepts as argument something which is itself a function. It is a function which accepts as argument a non-negative real number and returns a P by Q matrix. Okay, so L returns, the data type it returns is it returns a func an another function. This is a function which accepts as arguments some complex numbers and returns P by Q complex matrix. Okay, so it's, it's important to sort of think about this at least once. Um, after a while, of course, you'd go insane uh, if you thought about this every time somebody wrote down a Laplace transform. Um, and so it's not advised that you should think of it all the time, but you should definitely think of it once. I should also add something here, and that is that the value of things like the Laplace transform, or it, at least it's shifting, if not decreasing. Uh, because you know, what generation ago or two generations ago, this was actually one of the main tools for actually figuring out how things worked, for actually simulating things and all that sort of stuff. 
it's not now. It basically is not. So it's, it's mostly to, uh, to give you the conceptual ideas, to understand how things work, and all that sort of stuff. So things are shifting. And it's not as important, I think, as it, as it used to be. By the way, there are those who scream and turn red when I say that. Uh, we have, so, OK. Um, now, the integral, here, here you have the integral of a matrix. And of course, that's, that's, that's extended or overloaded to be uh, term by term or entry by entry. And the convention is that the upper, uh, an uppercase letter denotes the Laplace transform of, of, the, of the signal. This would be called maybe a, a signal. Some people call that a time domain signal, something like that. Obviously, t does not have to even represent time here. It makes no difference whatsoever what this means. It often means time, but it doesn't have to be. Now, d is called a d the domain or region of convergence of z. Um, this uh, probably, I mean, there's long discussions in books that are actually mostly, in my opinion, completely idiotic. I mean, there's absolutely no reason for this discussion. It makes no sense. It actually also has no particular use these days, other than confusing students. So, um, so I, I'll say a little bit about this later. But um, it includes at least the fall. It's a strip. It's, it's, it's a right half plane to the right of some, uh, some value a. Um, and that, that value a is any number for which this signal z grows slower than an exponential with uh, a uh, here, e to the a t, something like that. So that's what the, do the domain is. It's at least that. Um, now you might ask, you know, why do you, you know, why do you even care about signals that diverge? Um, that's a good question. Actually, you need to care about signals that diverge for a couple of reasons. First of all, that might be a pathology in something you're making. So if, if you want the error in, in something to go to zero, uh, tracking error or something like a decoding error to go to zero, and you design the thing wrong, then instead, your tracking error will diverge. So it's a pathology, and it, you need to have the language to describe divergence. Also, by the way, there's lots of cases where, uh, although it's often bad if a signal diverges, uh, that's by no means universally the case. If you're working out the dynamics of, of an economy, then uh, divergence is probably a good thing uh, in that case. So, OK. So let's look at the derivative property. This, th there's only a few things you use in the Laplace transform. It says the Laplace transform of the time derivative of a signal is s times the Laplace transform of the signal minus the initial value. Um, now, this is. Uh, it's the basic property. You know this is what Laplace, tra this is the whole point of Laplace transforms, essentially. Um, it's actually reasonably easy to just work out why this is the case. Um, you look at the Laplace transform of, of z dot, um, evaluate it at a function s. So that's a p by q complex number. And it's the integral, by definition, it's the integral of e to the minus st z dot of t dt. Now we integrate by parts. And we say that this is e to the minus st uh, z of t, so this is, uh, I guess this is u dv. That's uv evaluated over the, the interval. Uh, then minus integral v du, and that's what this is here. Okay? Now, here we're going to use the fact that the real part of s is large, because that's, that's the domain uh, that we're looking at. And that means that this goes to 0 very rapidly, and it'll swamp even if z is ex expanding. This will, this will uh, swamp that out. By the way, if z is growing at some, if, if you don't pick the real part of s large enough here, this integral, actually this integral, has no meaning whatsoever. It does not exist. Okay. So, so this is not sort of a convenience here. It's because this has no meaning unless uh, the integrand here is integrable. And if this is diverging, this the only thing you can say is that it just simply has no meaning. It's like 1 over 0. OK. Um, so this, this thing here, of course, goes uh, at, for infinity, it goes away. And this becomes minus z of 0, because I plug in t equals 0 here. And it doesn't matter what s is. And this gives me s z of s. So that's your derivative property. And now we can very quickly solve uh, x dot equals ax. That's an autonomous linear dynamical system. So what we're going to do is this. We'll take the Laplace transform on both sides. And on the left-hand side, and these are all vectors, I get s, capital X of s, minus x of 0. And that's a, capital X of s. X of s is the Laplace transform of x here. And what I'll do is I'll collect, I'll move this over to the other side. 
And I'll write this as S A minus S I minus A capital X of S equals X of zero. Now I've, I've isolated stuff I know, that's this, from, st from what I want, which is right here. And it's appearing in the right way. And therefore, at least formally, X of S is the inverse of this matrix times X of zero. Now, we're actually going to talk a lot of, about that. Uh, but this matrix here, of course, it need, you can't just casually write the inverse of a matrix. Um, you, if you write the inverse of a non-square matrix, that's just terrible. Actually, as far as I know, no one did that for the midterm, which makes us very happy. So, so the, 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 um, the, the uh, matrix police actually didn't actually file any complaints, I think. Actually, that's true. I, I don't know that, but I think that's true. Um, OK. However, SI minus A can fail to be invertible. Uh, we're going to get to that later. It turns out SI minus A is invertible for almost all complex numbers, except a handful. And we'll get to those. We'll get to the meaning of those um, soon. But for the moment, let's just say this is uh, for S minus A uh, invertible for the moment. And now we take the inverse Laplace transform and we have the answer. So x of t equals the inverse Laplace transform of si minus a inverse times x of 0. Um, notice here that the x of 0 comes out. There's a question? We are saying that, yes. That's exactly right. Right. So I'm using uh, linearity is the other thing I'm, I'm using here, which I didn't mention, but probably should have. Um, so I'm using linearity of Laplace transform. And now this is the matrix vector case. Um, you, the way you can check it is very simple. Um, the Laplace transform is an integral, uh, entry by entry. So, and then if you work out what a matrix vector multiply is, just write out with all the, the horrible indices, then stick the, in, the integral appears outside the sums, put the integral inside, and then recognize it for what it then put it back outside and so on and so forth and you'll get that. I don't know if that made any sense. But anyway, I, I'm using linearity of the Laplace transform. Okay. So you get this. Okay. Now, actually a bunch of things appearing here are very famous. They come up in zillions of problems. Um, this matrix SI minus A inverse comes up all the time. Lots and lots of fields. And it's called, so the mathematical, the, in mathematics it's called the resolvent of A. It's, notice it's a function of S, this complex number. So it's a, it's a function, it's a complex square matrix valued function. That's, it's the resolvent, SI minus A, inverse. Now, it's defined, of course, whenever this is invertible. If it's not invertible, of course, this inverse has no meaning here. So, the, only, the places where it has no meaning are actually called the eigenvalues of A. And these are the complex numbers for which debt SI minus A is zero. So these are the eigenvalues of A. Um, we're going to say an enormous amount about this. Um, there's only an N of those or fewer, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. So when you see SI minus A, you really have to, you have to understand when you write this, SI minus A inverse, sorry. When you see SI minus A, there's just no problem at all. When you see SI minus A, you have to have the understanding here that this, what you mean is this expression, you don't want to put a little star or something like this and have a little footnote down here that says, provided uh, S is not an eigenvalue of A or something like that. It gets silly. It's basically like if you write down a function like this, you know, S plus two squared over S minus one, okay? And you don't want to, you don't want to write, um, you know, every time you write this, you don't want to have a footnote that says, define for all s except s equals 1. So after a while, you get used to it, and you just write this. Um, by the way, you can get into trouble by forgetting that, in fact, there is, in fact, a footnote there for this one. There's a footnote, and the footnote says, whatever form, you know, whatever you're doing, uh, you plug in s equals 1 here, and all bets are off. Okay? So there is that footnote. But as long as you just remember that that footnote is in place, everything is okay. And the same thing is true here. So we'll write SI minus A inverse. That's the resolvent of A. Uh, it should just be understood that there are up to n complex numbers for which this is not invertible, and you shouldn't be writing the inverse. Okay. Now, 
uh, when you take this inverse Laplace transform here, this thing, that is a matrix valued function of time. It's going to have a name real soon, but it's, it's got a name. Uh, first of all, we're going to give it a, a, a general name. And it, it's, it's the state transition matrix. And it's denoted just phi of t. Okay? That's, that's, it's called the state transition matrix. And it looks like this. It says, it says it's actually already, we already have an interesting conclusion. We see that the state at any given time is a linear function of the initial state. So not surprising. It's a linear differential equation. But there it is. And if it's a linear function of the initial state, it's given by matrix multiplication. There's some matrix. And in fact, the matrix is the state transition matrix. Okay, so we get that. Um, we'll be able to, I mean, you can actually work this out. This is nothing but this, uh, you know everything here. In principle, you could take a matrix A, you can calculate SI minus A inverse, uh, at least in principle. Uh, you can take the Laplace transform of that. If the, the entries are rational functions, you can go get some Laplace transform table, take the inverse. So in some sense, it's done. You now know the dynamics of linear dynamical systems. I mean, of, of autonomous linear dynamical systems. You know everything now. In some weird theoretical sense. OK, so this is called the state transition matrix. So let's look at some examples real quick. First one is this one. It's a harmonic oscillator is the, na the name of the system. And it looks like this. It says x1 dot is x2. x2 dot is minus x1. OK? Now, if you plot the vector field, it looks like this. And here, it's certainly plausible that the trajectories are circular. Plausible. But it's not quite, um, I think it's not quite circular. Or, sorry, uh, scratch that. Actually, I just had a discussion this morning with the uh, people doing the video production. And I, so I said, I'd like to just remove, the, when I say things like that, just remove it. Just so it, it never happened. Um, and then they, they said, oh, no, no, there's huge, huge expenses to associate with that. So I can't remove these now. But anyway, that's the kind of thing, by the way. I'd like to remove. All right, so let's just pretend, let's just rewind, pretend I didn't say that, and go back. When you look at this, you can imagine with your eyeball, I guess, that the trajectories are circular or nearly circular or something like that. Now it turns out they're actually circular. We'll get, get to that. Let's see how this works. So we form SI minus A. Well, the inverse, this is the one inverse you should kind of know by heart, certainly. Well, there's a few special cases, but two by two inverse everyone should know. It's 1 over the determinant. And then you, uh, I guess you switch these and negate these. So that's, that's one thing ever, that, that's reasonable to know. And so SI minus A inverse, that's the resolvent is this. And notice that this, this matrix makes perfect sense for all complex numbers except plus minus J. But J is just because this, in this, this course is officially listed in electrical engineering. Uh, it should be, this should be I. So, you really sh the truth is, in, in mixed company, you shouldn't use J. Because um, it's, it's very um, outside uh, electrical engineering. It's very, um, it, it's, a di it's a dialect. Uh, so you shouldn't really use J. And my feeling is you shouldn't use J in mixed company. OK, so that's, but because the course is in EE, um, I'm going to use J. So, but, but I'm making it explicit. That's, this is not the, the, the high uh, BBC mathematical uh, phrase that would be used. That is absolutely universal in all fields, except electrical engineering, where you have this. Okay. And the reason, I think it goes back 100 years, and I apparently represented current. Now, how I got connected to current, I do not know. Uh, but nevertheless, it got, it got, they, the two got stuck together in the late 19th century, and, and then here we are 120 years later with J. So, sad, but OK. I might change that someday, because it's a bit weird. But not this quarter, so OK. Um, now, the state transition matrix is you simply take the inverse Laplace transform of this. Uh, no problem. You go look up in some table or something like that. And you'll find that the inverse Laplace transform, uh, entry by entry, is cosine t sine t minus sine t cosine t. And you saw this matrix before. That is a rotation matrix uh, of minus t uh, radians. That's what it is. OK? So that it simply rotates. What that means is this state transition matrix, and let's remember what it does. It maps initial states into the state t seconds later. 
This matrix here, rot it simply rotate, takes a vector, the initial vector, and rot rotates at negative t radians. Okay, so that's, that's what it does. So we've actually now verified that the motion in this system is a is perfect uh, periodic motion. You simply take a, a state vector, the initial vector, and you just rotate it at a constant angular velocity, in fact, of one radian per second here. So that's our complete time domain solution. Now, by the way, I want to point something out right off the bat. Um, we are generalizing this. That's a scalar differential equation. Now the solutions of this look like e to the at, oops, ta. You'll know why in a minute I keep writing ta. Um, so that's the solution, okay? Now qualitatively, the solutions of a first order scalar di linear differential equation are pretty boring. Basically there's only three qualitative possibilities. Number one, if a is positive, you get exponential growth. If A is negative, you get exponential decay. If A is zero, you get a constant. Okay? You, there is no way out of this thing you can get an oscillation or any other kind of uh, qualitative behavior other than growth, exponential growth, exponential decay, or constant. Well, this is x dot equals AX. A is two by two, and we just got something out of a first order linear differential equation that you are not gonna get out of a scalar one. We got oscillation. Okay, so when you generalize, when you go to vectors and you look at a first order, when you look at the vector version, x dot equals ax, you get solutions that don't just have exponentials in them, they can have cosines and sines. Okay, so, I mean, I, this is kind of obvious, but I just want to point it out that our generalization here has already, you've already seen behavior you could not possibly see in the scalar case. Okay, next case is uh, double integrator. So for a double integrator, you have x dot is 0, 1, 0, 0, x, like that. So x1 dot is x2, and x2 dot is 0. And the reason it's called a double integrator is the block diagram would look something like this. And this is going to be uh, maybe x1, and maybe that's x2. Everyone agree with that? Because x2 dot, this is 0 going in, x2 dot is over here is 0. And x1 dot, that's what went into the integrator, is x2. And I think that's this. So that's the block diagram. Um, in fact, when you saw this matrix, you should have had an overwhelming urge to cause a block diagram. Come to think of it, that should have happened here, too. Um, so let's just do this one for fun. Here's x1. And oh, I'm going to try to do this right. That's the output. That's x2. Okay, that's one over s. So let's, let's read this one. It says x1 dot is x2. So I'll just connect up this wire here like that. Okay, and this one says x1 dot is minus. So I put a minus one like that. There you go. So that's our, that's our block diagram for this thing. So that, that's the picture. So it's basically two integrators hooked into a feedback loop with a, with a minus one in the feedback loop. So that's what it is. Okay. Double integrator, that looks like this. And the solution, you know, is totally obvious. You don't need to know anything. I mean, you certainly don't need to know anything about matrices and things like that to solve this. If x2 dot is zero, x2 is a constant. But if x1 dot is a constant, x1 grows linearly. It's a, const it's a constant plus the second constant times t. So the solution, we could just work out it immediately, but let's just see if all this Laplace and other stuff works. So, oh, here's the vector field, which shows you what it is. The, the, if, if you start here, depending on your height, that tells you how fast you're moving to the right, or if you're down here, you're moving to the left, and so on. Let's work it out. Si minus a is equal to um, s uh, minus 1, 0 s. Uh, that's, a, that's a two by two uh, invertible, uh, sorry, upper triangular matrix. You should be able to invert that. SI minus A is this. One over S, one over S squared, zero, and one over S. Now, this is defined for all S except for one complex number, which is zero. Um, uh, you can list either zero or a pair of zeros. That's, we'll, we'll, we'll see why that is in a minute. But you, I should really say something like uh, the, on, the only eigenvalue is zero. At this point, I should say that. Okay. So that's that. Inverse Laplace transform is this. 
phi of t, that's the state transition matrix, it's 1, t0, 1. Okay? By the way, you've now seen something else that is just absolutely impossible in the scalar case. In the scalar case, if the solution of x dot equals ax grows, it grows exponentially. It cannot grow linearly in time. That's for a scalar. And yet, in the matrix case, you can have the solution of x dot equals ax grow linearly in time. Look at that. Okay? So, I just, I, it's very important to point out that you're seeing qualitatively different behavior than you could possibly see in a scalar differential equation. But this is not a big deal if you work out what this is. This says x2 of t is x2 of 0. We knew that because it was constant. And then it says x1 of t is equal to x1 of 0 plus t times x2 of 0. That's obvious because that's the derivative of x1. So it, it all works out and makes sense. OK. So let's, uh, let me just ask some quick questions here about this matrix phi of t. We'll get to this. Um, let me ask the following. What does the first column of phi of t mean? What does it mean? What's the first column of phi of t? It, it says what? It's what? X1? Correct. OK, so what does the first column of phi mean? It has a meaning. Yeah, it says, it says the following. The first column of this matrix tells you what the state trajectory is if the initial condition was E1. That's what it tells you. What does the first row of phi of t tell you? All right. Let's write down this. Phi of 10 equals 0, 0, minus 1, 30, 5. And of course, that's got to be a square matrix. Uh, there you go. Strange placement, but anyway, let's live with it. Um, what does that mean? That's phi of 10. That has a very specific meaning. What does it tell you? Which state at 10? All of them? Thank you. This tells you this row is what maps the entire vector x of 0 into x sub 1 of 10. That's what it does. So I, otherwise, I, I, I agree with your interpretation. So now, let, give your interpretation again. Exactly. So these two tell you, well, at least with the precision I've written them down, it says that x1 of 10 doesn't depend on the first two components of the initial state. Okay? This says it depends a whole lot and positively on the fourth component of the initial state. Everybody got this? So, okay. And this says, the first component of the third state actually has sort of an inhibitory effect on x1 of 10. Now, by the way, we're going to see interesting things where when you plug in 10, you get one thing. And when you plug in 100 or 0.1, you get something totally different. So now you can actually say things talk about when something has an effect, when an initial condition has an effect. OK? So, all right. OK. So let's talk about the characteristic polynomial. Uh, this is also very, very famous. The determinant of SI minus A comes up all over the place, and it's called the characteristic polynomial of the matrix A. Sometimes you put a, a subscript here to determine this. This is absolutely standard, um, standard language. So this is not some weird, strange dialect from electrical engineering or something. So that's called the characteristic polynomial. And it's a polynomial of degree n. And it's got a leading coefficient of 1. So by the way, some people call that it's a monic polynomial. Not some people, actually. Um, 
actually just people. Uh, it's called a monic polynomial, which means its, it's leading coefficient is 1. Um, and you can check that, uh, I don't know, over here, for example, um, det si minus a. It's the determinant of this thing, and it's just s squared. Well, that's about as simple as characteristic polynomials go. Uh, let's see. Let's do this one. Now, this is going to be, that is the same one. We'll do this one. So the characteristic polynomial of the matrix, which is 0, 1, minus 1, 0, the characteristic polynomial is det of this thing, which is, of course, s squared plus 1. So that's the characteristic polynomial of, of this thing. OK. So that's the characteristic polynomial. And the roots of this polynomial, basically, by definition, these are the eigenvalues of, of a matrix A. Okay. So actually, how many people have seen this somewhere else? OK, so this, this is the, yeah, this should be review. So the, the roots are simply defined to be the eigenvalues of, of, of the matrix A. Now, this matrix has real coefficients here. I mean, assuming A is, by the way, sometimes you look at complex linear dynamical systems. They do come up. They come up in communications. They come up in, for example, in physics. And they come up in all sorts of places. Um, but generally speaking, we're, we look at the, at the real case. and then. On an exceptional basis, we'll look at what happens uh, in the complex case. Right? So A is, if I don't say anything else, it's real. So this has real coefficients. Now, the polynomial, a polynomial with real coefficients has a root symmetry property. It says that the roots are either real or they occur in conjugate pairs. In other words, if lambda is a root and it's complex of this characteristic polynomial, so is lambda bar. It's conjugate. OK, so now you can see why people talk about n eigenvalues. When you have a polynomial of degree n, uh, the, the, maybe the correct way to say it is something like this. You can have anywhere between 1 and n uh, roots of an nth order polynomial. Okay? It, could, it can be full n, and it could be just, it could actually just be 1 root. And a good example would be s to the n. The only, root, the only zero of this polynomial is s equals 0. Okay? Now, what people do is they actually, in order to make the aesthetics of the fundamental theorem of algebra that says that a polynomial of degree n has n roots, to make that, you know, that statement have no footnote, you have to agree to count the multiplicity of the roots here. And so this, here you would count n of them. And then you can actually make the beautiful statement that an nth order polynomial has n roots. Of course, they might all be the same, but that's, that's, that, that, that's dealt with uh, elsewhere. OK. Now, if we take the resolvent, which is SI minus A inverse, it is likely, I guess, that you were at some point tortured with something called Cromer's rule. Is that, is that correct? This was this method for inverting matrices where you crossed out rows and you cross out a row and a column, took the determinant of what was left, and then you divide it by something else, and sometimes you put a minus one in front of it. Is this, is this, yeah. How many people actually saw that? Okay. How many people know how useful that is? So can, do, you know how you, do you know how useful it is? Yeah, it solves It solves equation, yeah. It was useful only for you to take that class. Um, it has no use of any kind. Well, ex other than right now, briefly, uh, we're, we're going to use it, but not really. No, it has absolutely no practical use whatsoever. Uh, no, under no circumstances are linear equations solved using this method, at least uh, after the late, mid to late 1820s. Um, so no, 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 that's not true. People, people did maybe, maybe all the way up into the 40s or something, but only because they didn't know what was going on. And yet, there it is in the curriculum. There it is. Might as well teach people how to do long division with Roman numerals. That would actually be more useful, come to think of it. So anyway, all right. Sorry, pardon me. Uh, <clears throat> OK. So you'll, this rule basically said this, that it said, it said take SI to calculate this matrix. You cross, out a, a, you cross out the a row and a column or something like that, the jth row and the ith column uh, of this matrix. 
Calculate the determinant, that's this thing. Divide by the determinant of the whole thing. Well, at least we have a name for that. That's, that's the characteristic polynomial here. And then you put a minus 1 to the i plus j in front, and that gives you the. Now, I don't actually care to do this. This is computationally completely intractable in any case, uh, because the number of turns of this is growing uh, hugely, and the whole thing is silly. Um, the, there's one thing I want out of this, and that's this, that every entry in the resolvent is a rational function, and they all have the same denominator, which is the characteristic polynomial. The numerator is another polynomial. It's the determinant of si minus a when you cross out the i, whatever, the, uh, one, of the, one row and one column, and take the determinant of what's there. That's what that is. OK? Now, when you do that, the, the, the degree of this uh, numerator polynomial is, is less than n. So what that says is that every entry of the resolvent looks like this. It looks like a polynomial of degree less than n divided by this polynomial whose degree is definitely n, because this thing, the coefficient of s to the n is 1 in chi of s here. That's 1. OK, so that, they all look like that. Uh, let's see, this is, there's a name for that. If you have a rational function, which is a ratio of two polynomials, and the denominator has a bigger degree than the numerator, it's called strictly proper. So again, don't need to know this, but that's, that's just what it's called. So every entry of the resolvent is strictly proper. Uh, one way to say that is, as s goes to infinity, the entries of si minus a all go to 0, okay? Which is kind of easy to see any, well, is it? I don't know. It's, it sort of makes sense. Look, as s goes to infinity, you get sort of like, you know, huge numbers times i minus a inverse. And it's, it's plausible, at least, that that should be a matrix that's small. Okay. Now comes the tricky part. It turns out that not all eigenvalues of a are going to show up as poles of each entry. Because although each entry looks like this, here's what's going to happen. In some cases, the numerator polynomial will also have some of the, eigen, some of the eigenvalues, the roots of chi, and those actually will cancel. Okay? So you'll actually not get that. I think, I think this will be clearer with examples and things like that. Let me see if I have one here. Um, oh, I did have one. Aha. Yes, we have one. A perfect example, if I can find it. Here's our perfect example. Great. OK, eigenvalues are 0 and 0, uh, zero, and zero. Um, here is the resolvent, OK? That's the, that's the resolvent right there. Now, I'll ask you about the poles of each entry of the resolvent. What are the poles of the 1, 1 entry? 0. Well, sure, they're the eigenvalues, OK? You could say the poles here is, you could say 0 and 0 for this one, right? That, that, you can say 0 and 0, and those are the eigenvalues. No surprise here. But now I ask you about this entry, the 2, 1 entry. What are the poles of the 2, 1 entry of the resolvent? There are none, OK? So the 2, 1 entry is a case where there's an entry in the resolvent that does not inherit a pole from the set of eigenvalues. Now, what if this had looked like this, like that? What would you have said? Well, if I'd asked what are the poles of the 2, 1 entry now, what would you say? 1. And then what would you say? You'd say it's impossible. Because the entries here, the poles, have to be among the eigenvalues. But it doesn't have to include all of them, as this 0 entry shows. OK. The significance of that, I think just the only examples and fiddling around is going to make it uh, with these things, is going to make it clear. OK, next topic is this. We are now going to overload. Oh, by the way, we have overloaded this. Um, if, if you didn't remember how to solve that, but that's the scalar case. But for some reason, you didn't know how to solve this, but you did remember all about Laplace transforms. I've always found that a little bit implausible. But anyway, let's just go with the story. Let's go with that story. You would have said, oh, you know, S. Um, capital X of S minus X of 0 equals A, you know, X of S. And you would have gotten a formula that looks like this. X of S is X of 0 divided by S minus um, A. Did I do that right? Something like that. You would have got that, right? And I'm allowed to write this uh, because these are scalars, okay? I mean, you now know 
you would write this, you know, that, that's, that is a scalar version of that. Okay? But this is what it looked like when you took an undergraduate class. And then someone would say, well, what, so what is x of t? And you'd say, well, it's the inverse Laplace transform of this. Okay? So we've, we've just worked out all of that. We've overloaded it now to the matrix case. And the only thing is that what had been a, uh, a, a, a fraction like this, this si minus a, I'm pretty, look, it couldn't have really, really couldn't have worked out many other ways. It came out in front as si minus a and has its own name, which is the resolvent. So, okay. But now we are going to overload the exponential. All right? So um, we'll start with a series expansion of i minus c inverse. This is actually the matrix uh, version of the scalar series you've seen. So i minus c inverse is i plus c plus c squared plus c cubed. And that's if the series converges, actually, quite soon we'll know exactly when it converges. But it certainly converges when c is small enough. It's small enough that the powers of the c's are getting smaller fast enough. Then this for sure converges. C is smaller or faster? I said we'll get to it later. So it's in a sense, actually, that in one lecture I'll be able, you'll know exactly what it is. I, I don't mind. I'll tell you. The absolute values of the eigenvalues of c, which are le I have magnitude less than one. That's, that's the exact condition. Okay? So, okay. Um, so let's look at this. And, and, you know, how would you show this? You'd show this by, multiply, by terminating the series at some point and then multiply, you know, telescoping the series. You'd multiply this by that and finding out that the, what would be left over would be c to the n, where n is where you truncated it. And then if c is going to zero, if c to the n as n gets bigger goes to zero, then you'd get this. So, so you have that. That's your series thing. Um, and we can just take this as formal. Now let's look at si minus a inverse. And let's, let's do this. Let's first pull out uh, s out of this. And we get I, i minus a over s inside. And we pull the s out, which becomes a 1 over s outside. It looks like that. That's a scalar. And you get i minus a over s. Now that's this formula here. And I'm going to use this power series expansion here of i minus c inverse. And if anyone bugs me about convergence, I'll wave my hands and say, oh, uh, yeah, right. This is only valid for s large. OK? That, that's how this is going to, if anyone bugs me about it, that's what I'm going to say. Okay? Because if s is large, a over s is small. And then um, in the way in which I didn't say, if c is small enough, this will converge. OK, so we get this. And this is simply i uh, plus a over s plus a over s squared plus a over s. Oh, by the way, of course, that's slang. Right? Everybody recognize that? That's, uh, that's, oh, that's considerable slang. But a lot of people write it. Um, maybe the correct way to write that is this. But then you get too many parentheses, and it starts looking really unattractive and stuff like that. So, um, but I figure now, post midterm, I can be a little bit more informal. So that's slang. Just wanted to mention it. So, um, I still, I don't know that I can actually still take things like this. That, that just looks weird for some reason. I, I you know, I, maybe I'll get used to it or whatever. But, and, and this looks kind of sick. And I just, like, why would you do that? Or so, I don't know. It just seems odd anyway. So, but for some reason, this just means the S, this, this seems to flow. So, and it sure beats that because it'd be a lot of parentheses otherwise. OK, so I write it this way. Oh, that's slang too. There we go. See, right there. That, that, that's a lot of slang, but that's OK. Uh, you know what's meant by it. So you take this, uh, this series expansion, and now let's take the inverse Laplace transform term by term. Well, if I do that, the inverse Laplace transform i over s, that's easy, that's i. Um, a over s squared, that's easy, that's ta. Then a squared over s cubed, that's ta squared over 2 factorial, and so on. So I get a power series that looks like that. OK? Well, that's interesting, because that looks just like this, e to the a t, like that. Except I'm, I'm going to start writing these as e to the t a. You'll see why in a minute. e to the t a. It looks just like that. So here's what we're going to do. We're simply going to define, all of that was just sort of a little background. We're simply going to define the matrix exponential this way. e to the m is i plus m plus m squared over 2 factorial plus m cubed over 3 factorial and so on. Okay? Now just the way the series for 
the power series for the ordinary exponential for a, a scalar, comp, real or complex number, converges for any number, right? Any number, even a big number, what happens is these terms get way big. Um, it, it will, they will converge, though, okay? Same way. It's true for all this. So this, this series converges for any matrix M. Um, how, does, how well does the series do for non-square matrices? What's the exp of a two by three matrix? What is it? Yeah, it just, it makes no sense. And uh, in fact, where would be the, where in the syntax pass would, would you halt? Oh, here? You'd stop already right here. I'd, I'd stop, I'd stop by the minute, the minute I parsed, when I got to, when I pulled the token M off and then asked somebody somewhere to add a two by three matrix with an identity, that'd be the problem. But you're right, I could say, you know what? I'm gonna let one go, just keep going. And then the M squared, <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, no problem, right? No, that's, that's actually what compilers do, right? They, 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 they try to get through as much as possible because the more they can get through, maybe the more informative their description of the exact kind of idiocy uh, you suffer from, uh, they can describe. So, you know, you'd say, you'd say okay, fine, this, this, this person is uh, adding an identity with a two by three matrix, no problem, let's just keep going. And then, indeed, you'd get to M squared, and you'd say, all right, I know what we're dealing with here. And then, then you return with a nice message, um, okay. So, yeah, so, so matrix exponentials don't, they don't exist for, but, they, but for any square matrix they exist. Uh, by the way, when you do an overloading, we've now just overloaded the exponential, it takes as argument a square matrix. Okay? Whenever you do an overloading, you want to check that in any context where the, where the two different contexts overlap, they better agree. So for example, if someone walks up, to, you know, if someone says uh, X A, and that's a scalar, I mean, there's this weird thing where you could say, no, 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 it's a one by one matrix, and you have to make sure it's the same thing. But of course it is the same thing, so everything's cool here. Okay. All right, so that's the matrix exponential, just defined for any matrix. And now, it turns out, that's just what, that's what the state transition matrix is. It's e to the ta. And so, what we've done is we've come around and we've figured out the following. The solution of x dot equals ax is this. It's x of t equals e to the ta x of zero. And I'm going to try to do this. You know, the problem is, I guess if you learn or, or teach, in my case, the under, you know, undergraduate classes, um, they, are all, they always look like this. It, it's always e to the at. Uh, did people see that? Is that what you saw? You know, it's kind of like cosine omega t, right? There's nothing wrong with a person writing this. But it's just weird and kind of... It goes against convention and I don't know what. It, is everyone, you know, does everyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, so for some reason, I have no idea why you put the T like this. So that was so ingrained in me from teaching undergraduate classes that for a long time I wrote E to the AT. And actually, a lot of people will do that. Um, but that's kind of, you know, that's weird. That's, that's that post, the scalar post multiplication of a matrix. It's, it's cool in some, in some, you know, depending on the social situation, it can be okay to post multiply a, a matrix by a scalar. Certainly among friends, on weekends, I don't see any problem with it. But it just somehow, it's just, it's not right. So, so, I'm, so I'm now retraining myself to write this as e to the ta. I don't know, just so that when I then teach this class, I have that. So, yeah, that's the idea. Anyway, so I, I'll slip up a few times and that's fine. Okay, so, so there you go. Now we have a name, and we know that the solution of x dot equals ax is e to the ta, uh, is, is x of t equals e to the ta x of zero. Feel free to have, when a is a scalar, this goes back to your undergraduate days. There's nothing here you didn't know about. When a is a matrix, that's the matrix exponential. Okay, so that's not, and it's the solution. So, okay, there you go. So the solution of that is this. Now, that gen uh, as I just said, that generalizes the scalar case. Note, note written here is TA. Now, a couple of warnings here, and in fact, this is what makes this fun. If in, if in fact everything just worked out 
it wouldn't really be fun. Um, and it wouldn't, if it didn't really require like outer cortical activity, I mean, if it was just notation, it's not interesting. So here's the, here, here's the, here's the idea behind this. The matrix exponential, it's, it's meant to, of course it's meant to look like the scalar exponential. That's absolutely by design. It's supposed to look like it, okay? Now what that means is that things you would guess, some things you will guess from your knowledge of the scalar exponential hold, okay? I'll show you one right now. So for example, e to the minus a is in fact e to the a inverse. That's true, okay? But there's lots of things from your undergraduate scalar exponential knowledge base which doesn't go, uh, doesn't actually extend to, it, it absolutely does not extend to the matrix case. So here's an example. Uh, you might guess that e to the a plus b is e to the a, e to the b. That is absolutely the case if a and b are scalars. It is false. In general, in fact, for almost, if you randomly pick a and b, it will be false. Um, by the way, you will know soon why, when you understand the dynamic interpretation of what e to the a means, you, you, and you thought about it carefully, other than as opposed to notationally, you would not even imagine that this would be the case because it's making a very strong statement. Um, anyway, this is false. Uh, quick, we've, we've actually worked out explicitly two matrix exponentials, so we'll, we'll use that work. Um, if a is this thing, e to the a is whatever the, that, it's a one radian, that's a one radian, negative one radian rotation matrix. e to the b is this thing, that's just straight from our formula. Um, you worked out what e to the a plus b is, we did not work that out, is, but I worked it out to a couple of significant figures, and it's not equal to uh, the other way around, okay? So it's just, they're just way different animals, okay? So, so be very, very careful with the matrix exponential. And with actually a bunch of the other stuff that we've overloaded. By the way, you know, this is not, it's not like you haven't seen this before, and i show you an example. You know, for example, that if these are scalars, and I say something like AB equals zero, you know that either A or B is zero. That's true. But if A and B are matrices, this is, a, it, it is false that either A or B is zero. Just false. Now, it becomes true with some assumptions about A and B and their size and rank and all that stuff. Um, but the point is, it's just not true that that implies A equals zero or B equals zero. And you kind of, you know, after a while you get used to it. And that's kind of, same thing for the matrix exponent. So it's not like you haven't seen stuff like this before. Okay. However, if A and B commute, so if AB is BA, if, if, if matrices commute, then in fact, this formula holds, okay? And that's easy to do. You just simply work out the power series. You take the powers, and then you, you're free to rearrange the A's and the B's, and you can make this power series look like that, okay? So, and that tells you immediately the following. If you have two numbers, T and S, then E to the TA plus SA is actually E to the TA times E to the SA, like that, okay? And if S is minus T, you get E to the TA times E to the minus TA, that's zero, okay? So that says that the exponential of TA is non-singular always, and it has inverse E to the TA inverse, which is just E to the minus TA. Uh, this will make a lot of sense in just a minute, in, in, uh, momentarily. All right. Uh, so how do you find the matrix exponential? Well, let's take 0, 1, 0, 0. There's lots of ways to find it. Uh, you could start by just, we already worked out e to the ta, so that's kind of silly. We just plug in t equals one and we get this. But we can also do it by power series. So by power series, we just take i plus a plus a squared over two. Um, a, what is a squared for this a? It's zero. Because this matrix is, uh, oh, okay, all right. Someone give me the English for what that does. I give a name for that matrix what it does. It, what does it do to a two vector? What does it do? I think I heard it. Shift up. Okay, let's call it the upshift matrix. So that's the upshift matrix. It takes a two vector, pushes the bottom entry up to the top, and, and fills in with a z and zero pads. So it fills in a zero. 
for the bottom entry. That's, this, that's, that's the up. So if you do that twice to a vector, there's nothing left. So a squared is 0, any vector. a cubed is 0. And actually, now this is something you don't see this in the scalar case. In the scalar case, when you work out the infinite series for the exponential, it's infinite, oh, except for one case, when the argument is 0. But other than e to the 0, that series is infinite. Here, for a non-zero matrix, the series was finite. Look, it only looked like an infinite series. It was finite. So that's one way to get, to get this matrix exponential. OK. Now the, um, the interpretation. How many people have seen the matrix exponential, by the way? I'm just sort of curious as to how many. So, somewhere. OK. So, all right. Now, here. Oh, and I should say, uh, uh, let me say a little bit. Of, uh, let me just give you one warning about this, and that's this. Um, if you type exp a in MATLAB, for example, but actually in, in many uh, systems, what you'll get actually is it's not what you think. What you'll get here is actually a matrix that looks like this. It's e to the a11, e to the a12. It's basically exponentiating all the entries. Now let's forget the fact that there's probably one out of 100 million possible cases where you'd ever want to do such a thing. Okay, but nevertheless, that's what happens, just to warn you. So in fact, the way this is, it's actually exp m of a. And that means the matrix exponential. So that's, how, that's what people call this. Um, so just be aware of this when you start. You, you will be fiddling with this. So just, just be aware of it. And you'll make this mistake. There'll be many ways to check what you're doing. Uh, by the way, the two would agree uh, in, I think, basically in almost no cases or something like that. So, um, but the worst part is it could, it, you might get something that's like plausible or something. That's the worst part. Um, so you just have to check and be aware of this. Okay. Um, by the way, the way to compute the matrix exponential, it is not done by any of the methods. Um, nothing is computing a Laplace transform, I assure you. Um, you'll know soon a little bit how, how it's done. <clears throat> Turns out it's actually not that easy to calculate the matrix exponential. Um, and there's a, there's a wonderful paper, paper uh, about computing the matrix exponential. And the title is 19 Dubious Methods for Computing the Matrix Exponential. And it goes through, it talks about 19 methods that people have used, shows how each one can in the wrong circumstances with the wrong A, give you like totally uh, wrong results and things like that. So that's it. So, but that for paper titles, I thought that was, that's, that's right up there, I think. Okay, so uh, we'll be able to finish today. And actually, it's very important to actually, I mean, know what is the meaning of the matrix exponential. And this is extremely important. It's this. So far, it has a very specific meaning. E to the TA is an n by n matrix. It maps the initial state of, a, of x dot equals ax into the state at time t. So I think of it as a, a time propagator. It propagates from initial time to time t. OK? Now, it turns out, actually, it actually, it, 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 you can actually work out the following, that x of t tau plus t is equal to e to the ta times x of tau for any tau here. So in fact, the matrix e to the ta is a, it, it propagates a state forward in time t seconds. It propagates x of 0 into x of t. But for example, it will propagate x of 17.3 into x of 17.3 plus t. Okay? This times e to the ta is going to equal that. Because this propagates a state of a linear system forward t seconds. Um, by the way, with a minus sign, it works just as well here. You can check that. It works just as well for a minus sign. So e to the minus a is a matrix that propagates a, the state backwards in time one second. That's what it means. Okay, so. These are, these are kind of basic, uh, basic facts. That's what the matrix exponential means, right? So it, it's going to mean all sorts of interesting things. And from that, you can derive 
all sorts of interesting facts about linear dynamical systems, how they propagate forward, backward in time, and things like that. Okay, so now the interesting thing here is if you have, um, if you know the state at any time, any time, you actually, at fixed one time, you know it for all times because you can now propagate it forward in time with its exponential and you can propagate it backward in time. So for example, I can go to some chemical reaction or some bioreactor described by x dot equals ax. I can take a measurement of x at time 12. And then from that, I can infer what x of 0 was, even if I didn't measure it. Why didn't I measure it? Maybe because it was too, the numbers were so small, the colonies hadn't grown yet, and I can only measure them when they got up to the billions or trillions or something like that. Everybody see what I'm saying here? So in fact, how do you get x of 0 if I tell you what x of 12 is? What do I write here? E minus 12a. That'll do it. Okay? So, so E to the minus 12a is a matrix that, that actually goes, back, it's a, goes backwards in time 12 seconds. Okay? So that's what it is. Now, we can actually connect a few things up now that's kind of cool. Um, we looked earlier uh, at, a, at a forward Euler approximate uh, state update. Now, the forward Euler approximate state update said, if you want to know what is x of t at time tau plus t, it, what am I doing? If you want to know what x of t tau plus t is, you'd say, well, that's about equal to x of tau plus, and this, this requires t small, and an approximation, so I squiggleize these. There we go. It's a new verb. Um, x of tau plus t times x dot of tau, like that. Okay? Now that's an approximation. And it's based on, it basically, this is, uh, some people call, by the way, this is called dead reckoning in a lot of, uh, because basically you say you're going in that direction, you check your watch, check the, the elapsed time, and say, you know, where are you now? We're like that bearing times the time, that's where we are. So, that's the approximation. Now, this thing is a x of tau. And so this is i plus t a times x of tau, like that. So, so this is an approximate, it's an approximate t second forward propagator. It's the forward Euler propagator, is what people would call it. But now we know the exact t second forward propagator. The exact t-second uh, forward operator is the exponential. And look at this. This thing is merely the first two terms in the Taylor series. Okay? So now you can see forward Euler is basically just one term in the exponential series. Um, you could take two and three and all that kind of stuff. So that's the idea. Okay. So Let's, uh, let's take a look at this and let's, let's talk about the idea of, of sampling. There's a lot of, actually already, there's a lot of applications of, of, what, of what you see. Just simple, just simple ones immediately. So if someone says, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got some measurements of, uh, of, x, of, of x of t sam you know, at different times, um, but I didn't know what it was in between, how would you do that? What if you... How would you do that? In fact, let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. You have x dot is ax. Let's make it a bioreactor. We talked about that before. Um, and suppose you make an assay. You, you measure the, the thing at like x of 13.1, x of 15, you know, x of 22, like that. And someone comes along and says, what, is, what was the state? And the state might be, by the way, the volume of different uh, colonies or concentrations or whatever. Here. Okay? And they want to know what's that. And the first answer is, sorry, we didn't do an assay at t equals 10 hours. What do you do? Let's say you measured it at 8, 2. What do you do? Give me some methods. Give me a method. You know A. You've measured x of 8, x of 13.1, x of 15, x of 22. And I want to I I get x of 10. 
Don't worry, so far the measurements have been perfect. They're absolutely perfect. A is not a lie. What do you do? Perfect. So here's one. Ready? Reconstruction formula number one. T tell me what to write, please. What do I write here? E to the 2A. And the comment is propagate forward two seconds. Oh, hours. Or whatever we said. Whatever the unit is. Right? How about this? You said you could, we could take this one, x of 13.1, e to the what? Okay, and this is propagate backwards, uh, three point, no, 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 come on. That's not right. This is e to the minus 3.1. Okay, great. I said that before. That reflects on you, you know, not me. Right. So it's the length between I write something idiotic and you correct it. Thank you. I knew that. I was just testing you. Okay. Fine, so we have that. All right. Um, oh, by the way, which of these is better? Hmm? They're what? This one. You like that one, why? Mm. You think the lat, so you, we got two, two people over here say the former. They like propagating forward. But you, oh, because you're propagating forward two hours. Is that, is that it? Oh, you have to calculate. Okay. Ooh, okay. All right. So, all right. Could you have calculated from x15? Sure. No problem. E to the minus 5a times x of 15. Okay. So, which of these is better? Well, if there's no noise and a is exactly what you think it is, they're all exactly the same. So, this could actually be an assertion here. Um, and if it's not, by the way, if these are not, if, the, if you calculate these and you get two different answers, it means you're going to have to do something more sophisticated. Okay. And just for fun, just given this state in the course, what would you do? If someone gave you all this data, just a quick thing, quick, what would you do? You might do some least squares, exactly. You, you might, I mean, first of all, you might propagate all of these to time 10. Okay? If they're like all over the map, you would say, um, you'd go back to the person and you'd say, can we talk? Okay, that's, that's what you would do here. Now, if, they, if they're not all over the map, but just sort of, you know, you know, one is estimating one thing, one's a, they're a little bit different, and they're not like, uh, you know, weird numbers, you know, varying by factors of 10. If that's the case, that's going to come out really, really nicely, by the way, on the uh, tape. This, uh, that, that was me talking while inserting this thing back into its thing. Okay. Um, uh, what you might do is, is take all those things back and then do some kind of least squares fit. That, that's what you might do, right? And by the way, you, that'd be a very, very good method. Um, that, that would be a perfectly practical method. Actually, methods like that are used plenty. So, okay. So we will we'll quit uh, here and continue next time. And let me remind you, for those of you who came in late, the midterms actually are graded. Solutions are posted. They'll be available, I guess, if you follow me up to Packard.